All right. This is the final session of Demystifying Revelation. So we've gone through 24 sessions. We are now in the very last chapter. Uh, chapter 22, the grand finale, the epilogue, the invitation, and the warning from the book of Revelation. It's all very, very important, so let's get with it. Now, we left off last time uh, with uh, verse 5, which ended the, uh, the vision that was given to John. So uh, we're starting up now in verse 6, which now starts uh, the final closing statements. Verse 6. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angels to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, have the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So, we'll break down this session. Verse 6, he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants, which what must soon take place. Now, this has a similar ending to like what we read in Daniel in chapter 2, the, the uh, dream given to Nebuchadnezzar, where Daniel says, the dream is certain and its interpretation sure. And here we see in Revelation uh, a conclusion with a reminder that this whole book is really from God himself with extremely important information concerning salvation and the coming of God's kingdom, the gospel message. And with this, there's blessings for all who obey and put their faith and hope and trust in God. And there are curses to those who intentionally disobey, discredit, or disown him. Talking about the God of the spirits, of the prophets, had sent his angel. This not only verifies the validity of revelation as coming from the Holy Spirit, from God himself, but once again, this shows the importance of studying the Old Testament and all the prophecies. Because Revelation, once again, is a culmination of all these prophecies. And don't forget the word of Jesus, where we started way back in chapter 1, where in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And to fill what must soon take place, the Greek word here is takos, and it means speedily, soon, or with speed. And once again, it, it sometimes these translators are put in a conundrum of how to translate these words. Well, in context, uh, you may th think that it's like, oh, it's going to happen any second now, happen any second now. But that's not necessarily what the word could mean. The word could mean that when it, it takes place speedily or in an amplified uh, uh, phrase, it would be like, when it takes place, when it happens, guess what? It's going to happen quickly. It's going to happen so fast your head is going to be spinning of how fast things can happen once they start. Verse 7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. 
So um, written in red letters, um, all the translators pretty much in agreement. This is Jesus himself coming. I am coming soon. Now, once again, that's the word tacos, what we've already talked about, speedily, soon, or with speed. But uh, this interpretation of when it happens, it will happen fast and un unexpected. Uh, it would also explain what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, where he says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Well, what's that like? Well, like a thief in the night, like one moment your possessions are there, the next moment it's gone. It happens that fast. Um, Jesus, in Revelation 16, uh, the parathetical statement where he says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. A very important point made by Jesus, uh, that when he comes, it's all going to come fast. And if you're not prepared, it could go not so good for you. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. This is another one of the Beatitudes uh, found in Revelation. I think there's like seven of them. Uh, but uh, like the very first one in chapter 1, verse 3, and throughout the whole book, uh, there are these Beatitudes. And this one in particular carries God's blessing to those who obey the words of this prophecy. Revelation 1, 3. Remember, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Which is what Jesus Christ is saying here in verse 7. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy. Verse 8. I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down and worshiped at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, you must not do that. <coughs> Excuse me. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Only, only, only God is to be worshipped. Now, this is twice now that uh, it's recorded that John attempts to worship an angel and is rebuked by the angel. And why, why does John make the decision to record this embarrassment, this utter embarrassment by an apostle in the book of Revelation? The important message here is that even an apostle can be confused or tempted into worshiping something or someone that seems spectacular or glorious or spiritual other than God. And that is wrong, wrong, wrong. And uh, contemporary examples in today's world would be exalting or worshiping or praying to a saint or an angel or the Virgin Mary, uh, even though I put that in parentheses because she, she was a virgin for the birth of Jesus Christ, but after that, uh, she did bore other children um, to Joseph. So let's move on. Verse 10, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let and then let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. Okay. Let's unpack this. Unlike Daniel, who was told to seal up the words of prophecy, why? Because Daniel was such a long time ago and the readers back then would not understand until the latter days and then seeing what they're seeing, things will start to connect. Uh, uh, they'll start to connect the dots. But in this case, John is told quite the opposite. He says, do not seal up the words. The book of Revelation is therefore today presented to us unsealed 
and therefore it urgently needs to be shared and taught in all the churches, amongst all the saints. This is something that each and every one of us should know and understand and, and abide by and prepare ourselves for what the future has to hold, and especially in the world today, because we're seeing this is, uh, we're definitely living in the latter days, very possibly the very, very, very beginning of birth pains. But then we are instructed to do something that might be hard to understand and accept. Let the evildoer still do evil. Don't try to change them. And this is not a suggestion. This is a command. In other words, do not hinder the evil person who has, in spite of all the information that's out there, all the pleadings, all the exhortations, has decided to choose the way of the world. And in the words of Jesus, uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 6, he, what did he say? He says, do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. And we're seeing more and more of this evidence in the world today that we live in. A lot of anger, a lot of hate, especially against God and God's chosen people and the church. Now, something similar was also recorded in Daniel and Ezekiel, Daniel 12, 9, where Daniel instructed, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Okay? But then it said, Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none shall. Of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. Ezekiel 3.27, thus says the Lord God, He who will hear, let him hear. And he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse. For they are a rebellious house. So this is one area where we need to be like God. In other words, God has given us a freedom of choice. God has given us a free will. God has communicated in black and white terms what is holy, what is unholy, uh, what is moral and the moral code, and uh, what is evil. And as we know, we're living in a time where um, evil is being called good and good is being called evil. And God is saying... Let those who refuse to hear, let them refuse. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon. We're hearing this again. Bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. So what all does this mean? Well, first and foremost, behold, I am coming soon. This is once again the word tacos. When he comes, it's going to be speedily, it's going to be soon or with speed. But to repay each one for what he has done and also bring in my recompense. What all does this mean? Well, this has been a common theme throughout, the, throughout Scripture. It just reiterates what Scripture has been proclaiming for all along, that deeds will carry what we do in life, carry either rewards or judgment. Or I guess in all cases we could say it all carries judgment, but some of the judgment is to eternal life, some is to the second death. So let's look at some verses here. Jeremiah 17, 10, where God says, I, the Lord, I search the heart, I test the mind. To give every man, without exception, according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Paul put it in two, Romans 2 6. He, Jesus Christ, will render to each one according to his works. 
The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 17, And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially, according to how? To each one's deeds. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And uh, remember what Jesus Christ said to all seven churches. He started off saying what? I know your deeds. And then he would say what he disliked and what he liked. So these deeds and rewards and recompense, well, they have nothing to do with justification or salvation, but they have everything to do with kingdom rewards. But justification and salvation is accomplished by the deed of one person and one person alone, and that is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, because perfection, the perfect sacrifice, was the only way to acceptance by God. And as we know, there is none among us that are perfect. However, like we said, works demonstrate. They demonstrate. They're the fruit uh, that is seen and shown that shows whether that person has truly put their faith in Jesus. So our fruit, our deeds, walking the talk is vitally, vitally important. Jesus goes on to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Okay, he starts off saying, I am, which is... Uh, uh, kind of a, a signature of both the Father and the Son. Um, I am, the great I am. And to clear up any confusion on titles being given to God, the Father, Yahweh, and to Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Jesus here is boldly proclaiming his own deity, that he was also present, that he is also sovereign over the beginning and the end of all creation. Verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Or shall we say that they may enter into the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God. Okay, so blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, what all does that mean? Uh, do I just wash my robes in a washing machine? No, that's not what it's saying. Uh, one thing that's important is go back to uh, the reminder that was given to the church of Sardis in, uh, in the letter to that church in Revelation 3, verse 6. It says, Jesus Christ says, he starts, I know your deeds. <laughs> you have a reputation of being alive. At least that's what other people think. Or oh, that's what you think. But you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. And he goes on to say, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white. For they are worthy. The one who conquers, or to the one who overcomes, will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So, um, how do we wash our robes or how are our robes washed clean? Well, that's explained in Revelation later in chapter 7, verse 14. They have washed their robes and have made them white 
in the blood of the Lamb. Remember, it's what Jesus has done and accomplished. That's the only way we can wash our robes. And then he goes on, verse 15. <clears throat> Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So this is kind of a summation of what we already read in chapter 21. So outside, what's outside? Well, that just means excluded from the kingdom of God. And we already know where that is. That is going to be in the lake of fire, the second death. Dogs, well, dogs are another name for evildoers. So who are these dogs and sorcerers? Well, dogs in Matthew 7, Jesus explains earlier, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw pearls to pigs, because if you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. In uh, Philippians 3, 2, watch out for those dogs. What do we mean? Those evil doers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. But all this that's listed, the dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, everyone that loves and practices falsehood, these are all examples of works that will lead to judgment of damnation, judgment of being thrown into the lake of fire and the second death. <coughs> Continuing on in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. For, as I have often told you before and now i tell you again even with tears this is how important it is many live as enemies of the cross of christ their destiny is destruction their god is their stomach and their glory is in their shame their mind is set on earthly things their mind is set on the ways of the world they put more faith and credence and, and uh, attention to the ways of the world than to the ways of God. And that should be a very stern warning to us. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So, uh, Jesus says, I've sent my angel to testify to you. Well, the you here is plural. It's, it's uh, in American, it's y'all or you guys. And the meaning of this message is coming directly from Christ. And it's given to, to who? To the churches, for the churches, as it says here. To the saints as a whole. It's vitally important that churches <coughs> teach, study, preach the prophecies found in revelation and so often churches will shy away from the book of revelation thinking oh that's just too complicated or or uh, too too much out there it's not this is important stuff and then jesus goes on to say i am the root and the descendant of david the bright and morning star so the root and descendant of David, Jesus is not only the prophesied descendant of David that we found in Isaiah, but hello, guess what? Jesus clarifies that he is also David's root. He's the beginning of the line of David. He's also the bright and morning star. Uh, I would say that's probably first prophesied by uh, uh, the prophet for hire, Balaam, uh, found in Numbers 24. And by the way, Numbers 24 is a very key and important end-time prophecy that all should be familiar with. But we're just going to look at verse 17, where Balaam says, I see him, but not now. So he's in the future. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter 
shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Shith. So uh, once again, this is kind of referring back to the Proto-Evangelum, uh, Genesis uh, 3.15, where uh, the seed of the woman will sh crush the head of the serpent. Verse 17, the bride, correction, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. That will be us. And let the one who is thirsty come. That better be us. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. So the spirit and bride, bride say, come. This should be the calling of the church to its own. That should be our altar call. Uh, that should be uh, more frequent on Sundays than, than it is. And to the world. The gospel message. What was the gospel message? God's kingdom come. How do we get into God's kingdom? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That should be our message as well. Uh, the word of our testimony. Remember how important that is. And it says here, let the one who is thirsty come. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, how thirsty are you for God? Are you really, really thirsty or for God? Or is God nothing more than, oh, yeah, I need to set aside what I'm doing and go to church on Sunday and listen to a 20-minute sermon that, and, uh, yeah, uh, then I'll go back to my ways. It should be like what was written by David in Psalms 42, verse 2. Just as a deer longs for running streams or... Uh, as uh, as my soul panteth uh, in King James, God, I long for you. I am thirsty for God, for the living God. When can I come and appear before God? And that should be our life. We're just passing through. We got to remember that. Home will be eternal, and it will either be God's kingdom or the lake of fire. We're instructed to take the water of life without price. Well, that is because this water of life no man could ever purchase or achieve by deeds. Uh, Prophet Isaiah 55 verse 1, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come. Why? Because it's been already purchased for you by our Lord Jesus Christ. So buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God, God will take away his share in the tree of life, and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So this message is for who? I warn everyone, and if anyone takes away. These are the very words of God. And what he's saying is to knowingly, intentionally alter God's word for selfish or political means carries eternal damning consequences. Beloved, never, ever take away from God's word. Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord Yahweh, your God, that I command you. Later on, chapter 12, verse 32, everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Now, 
obviously the, the context back then is a little context, a little different from the context of today. Uh, we don't live in legalism uh, by the law, but at the same time, there's the spirit of the law that we live our lives by. That's a whole different separate teaching, uh, but take heed. And while this warning applies to the Bible as a whole, now in a more uh, specific context, uh, as this was being read to the early church and in the first century A.D., this is probably a specific warning that's levied against the false teachers, the false prophets, and the false apostles that were um, infecting the early church. Second Peter uh, 2.1, he warns about, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing them upon themselves swift destruction. And sadly, we even see that today with, with everybody having their own copy of the Bible, um, which was not the case back then. James 3, 1, a specific warning to teachers that um, uh, I tell you, I take this very, very personally. James 3, 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brother, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So to whom much is given, much is required. And if you ever decide to take on teaching, take this to heart. Be very, very careful of how you teach and how you manage uh, God's word. And so finally, then, the obvious question, how seriously should we personally take the words of this book? How seriously should the church take the words of this book? And the answer is very, very seriously. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So surely I am coming soon. The final word recorded from our Lord Jesus Christ, not only in Revelation, but in all of Scripture. And this verse, in, in essence, it summarizes not only Revelation, but it's the conclusion of all Scripture. What's the good news? He's coming. He's coming soon. His king, he's going to establish his kingdom. This is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. This is the fulfillment of the gospel and the epistles. And we're reminded once again that Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never changing. He's the great I am. He's. And so what do we say? We say, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. This is the equivalent of the Aramaic, uh, Marana Atta, or the Greek, Maranatha. We know it as translated, transliterated into English as Maranatha. Maranatha, this was a common phrase that was used in the early church, uh, probably as part of ending of prayers and benedictions. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. And the book of Revelation ends in verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to end this part one of the video here, and then we will do some reflections and look at some uh, timelines in part two.